Let me just remind you that the combination formula, NCR, is N factorial divided by N minus R factorial over R factorial. Also, 0 factorial equals 1, just as an aside. All right, so let's talk about some counting techniques. I'm going to do it in terms of this combination stuff. For the first one with cards, it's actually small enough that I can break it down to what I promised, that deep down inside this is always um, number of desired outcomes divided by total possible outcome numbers. But we need to get it in terms of this combination business because we need to be able to count large things, things that we couldn't possibly do by hand. So a standard deck of 52 cards with four suits is used. What's the chance that I draw two cards out of the same suit without replacement? Well, first of all, let's talk about this in terms of combination. Maybe I can move my little divider line over here just a smidge. So in terms of combinations, what's really happening? Well, for our total possible outcomes, there's 52 cards in a deck, and I'm choosing two of them. So I have 52 choose 2, that's my denominator. Then on the top, what happens? Well, I'm drawing two cards of the same suit. How do I do that? Well, let's think of a one particular suit. There's 13 cards in a suit. Of those 13, I'm choosing two. This happens one time, two times, three times, four times, because there's four suits. So I get this. But let's use this formula. Now, your calculator probably has an NCR button. But supposing it doesn't, I'd start plugging into my formula, and I'd have 13 factorial over 13 minus 2 gives me 11 factorial, 2 factorial, all divided by uh, 52 factorial over 50 factorial, 2 factorial. Which means I can take this bottom part and invert and multiply, and this gives me 4, 13 factorial, 2 factorial, 11 factorial, and I have 50 factorial, 2 factorial, over 52 factorial when I take the bottom and invert and multiply over here. Next, some cancellation happens. The 2 factorials cancel out. Also, 11 factorial cancels with part of 13 factorial and just leaves me with 13 times 12. And 50 factorial cancels with most of the 52 factorial, leaving me with just 52 times 51. So now for my fractions, I have 4 times 12 times 13. And on the bottom, I have 52 times 51. Before I go any further with this, let me go over here and work out how I might have worked this out without combinations. I have 52 cards. It doesn't matter what card I draw first. I'm drawing out of 52, and it doesn't matter what card I draw first, because I haven't picked a suit yet when I draw that first card. So I'm choosing any of the 52 cards out of 52, which means I have a 100% chance of drawing a first card. When I draw my second card, I'm no longer drawing out of 52. I'm drawing out of 51. And for my second card, I've already picked a suit. Whatever the first card was, that already determined my suit. So it's not 13 cards in a suit anymore. There's only 12 left in that particular suit. So this is how I would have done it sort of old school. Let's go back over to here and reorganize this a little bit. So I want to have 52 first and 51 second. I've got 52 and 51 in my denominator. Then I have 4 times 13 times 12. I'm allowed to reorganize multiplication in this way. 4 times 13 is 52. And notice these two match up and are exactly the same. And this will give me my approximately 23% that I'd get if you multiply it out. Notice, though, this made pretty good sense. Out of 13 cards, I'm choosing two. I could do this for any of four suits. Out of 52 cards, I'm choosing two. That's my total possible. I think this over here also made sense. In this case, I think it was pretty much 50-50. Again, you wouldn't have to do all this middle work in general. You would just calculate this. I just did all this to convince you the two were the same. Now let's talk about something that isn't quite the same. There's too many 
here to deal with in any other way. A university has 75 students. They are all equally qualified for a full ride scholarship that includes room and board, which is awesome. There's 18 of these scholarships available, and there's two types. Seven of them include monthly stipends. You have to do some research assistant work, some RA business in a lab for some different faculty. On the other hand, 11 don't have the stipend. You have a little more free time, but you don't get you know, some money for food. What's the chance that you, A, you're accepted for a scholarship if you're one of these 75 students, who's all equally qualified, and B, if you and your friend are one of these 75 students, that you both get the same scholarship, so nobody's jealous? Well, first of all, I've got some key words here, equally qualified. This is kind of hard to do in the real world, but we're supposing they are actually equally qualified, so we're just going to draw these people out by lottery. Part A is easy. What's the chance that you get picked? Well, the desired outcome is a scholarship. How many total possible people are there to pick? 75. Done. You and your friend both getting picked for the same scholarship is a little bit trickier. This is going to come in two parts. First part, let me draw myself just a little bit more space in this. Sort of got blocking parts. Here's all the people who are not you guys. I guess I'm in uh, Texas, you all, y'all. Um, and on the other hand, there is you and your friend. No matter which you're dealing with, you've got some uh, different circumstances going on here. Let's talk about this one. Out of 75 students total, you're choosing 18 for a scholarship. This is the total possible ways it can happen. However, what's happening? There's 18 scholarships, but two of them have already been taken because I'm saying you and your friend are both getting the same scholarship. You and your friend have already won the scholarship. <coughs> Excuse me. You and your friend have already won the scholarship business. There's nothing left to think about there. However, some people, in particular, there's 73 people left who still need to be picked for a scholarship. But there's not 18 scholarships left. There's 16. You and your friend have already taken two of the scholarships. So this is everybody else. Now let's talk about you and your friend. You guys have already won a scholarship, so your denominator is not 75 choose 18. You've already won. You've gotten past that first hurdle. Instead, out of the 18 scholarships that there are, you and your friend are getting two of those. You've already gotten in, so your denominator is different. The total possible for you and your friend is not the same as it is for the other 73 people. What's also different is what's happening here on top. It's not enough that you and your friend get a scholarship. We're curious about you and your friend both getting the same one. That means there's two different ways you guys could win. On the one hand, you both might be picked for the one with the stipend. That would be seven options. You and your friend only make up two people. or you both might get the one where you don't have stipends. Either way, it's choose two both times, but there's seven with stipends and eleven without. So this is how I build up part B. Again, I'm not doing the actual calculation out for the permutation, or the, excuse me, the combination, but you are going to want to do that. I'm just setting it up, solving the hard part and explaining it. Last example that I've got going on here. A student studying for a math exam knows the definitions of 15 formula on a list of 25 that the professors mentioned in lecture. If the exam uses 12, there's 12 questions on the exam, and it uses 12 of those, what's the probability that at least 9 are ones the student knows? Namely, what's the student's chance of at least getting a 9 out of 12, which is a 75%, so you're trying to get a C. You know more than half the exams on the list, or half the formulas on the list. You know 15 out of 25. 
That's pretty good. You've done some intense studying. What's your chance of knowing things? First of all, watch out for some interesting things. At least. That means I'm going to have several options. Both get the same. That means I'm going to have some options. And these options are going to be joined together by addition. So let's talk about what options I've got. I could get exactly 9 right. The student could get exactly 10 questions right. They could get exactly 11. Or they could get all 12 questions correct. How exactly could this happen? Well, that's what we've got to figure out next. It's going to be a fraction. It always is with probability. What are the total possible options? Well, there are 25 total formulas that the professor has to choose from. And of those, the professor has to pick 12 of them. And this happens no matter what. When I write an exam, I don't have to write it hundreds of times. I write it once. This is my part. That's what gets the total possible up. There's 25 total things I've talked about. I'm choosing 12 of them to go on to the test. Next, what have you got? Well, for exactly 9 correct, how does that 9 work? There's 15 questions that you know, 15 formulas you know. Of those 15, you want to get 9 of them. It doesn't matter which 9 you pick out of the 15, but you have to pick 9 of them. But there's something left over. On the exam, there's 12 questions total. That means there's three questions left that you have to get wrong. Where do you pick those three questions that you get wrong? There's 25 questions total. You know 15 of them. There's 10 formula that you don't know. So you're choosing those three that you get wrong. These are the right answers. This is the wrong one. And we're going to have that each time, right and wrong, right and wrong right and wrong. And this gives you your total desired. So don't let the word desired fool you. It's not what you want. Desired is what you're after. Here I'm after getting nine correct. That comes with it, the fact that I got three wrong. It's not that I want to get wrong things, but this is what I desire in terms of my number of possible desired outcomes on top. I'm desiring nine correct. That comes at a cost. So each time I'm choosing out of 15 and 10, But next, I want 10 right. That means there's only two left to get wrong. Next, I want 11 right. That means there's only one left to get wrong. Finally, I want all 12 correct. That means there's only zero left to get wrong. This is just one, so we don't usually talk about it. Calculate this out, and you'll see what your chances are of getting there. So this combination business can actually make more sense if you actually kind of ignore for a second what the formula is. Because notice, the formula inside gets a little messy. But when we're trying to describe what's going on, this combination business makes sense. There's 75 people, and we're choosing 18 scholarships. Now, you and your friend already won, so there's 73 people left, and they're fighting for the leftover 16. Now, for you and your friend, out of the 18 scholarships, you have to pick two. But you don't want everything there. That's the total possible. You were being picky. You want them, to, you guys to have the same. So from 7 you have to pick 2, or from 11 you've got to get 2, so that you both have the same type of scholarship. So this business of choosing can make thinking about these problems easy. And then once you've got that, once you have all these numbers, then you either just take it and plug it into this formula, or if your calculator has the button, you just hit 15, choose 9, and get your numbers. Multiply those out, and you're done.